Ladies and gentlemen, dear community of the Paper Jam Club members, dear guests, good morning. Welcome to this webinar, Innovation in Health and Life Insurance in Benelux. Let me introduce myself. I am Julian Delpy, the director of the Paper Jam Club, and I have the pleasure of being your moderator today. Uh, some of you might be joining us for the first time, so welcome. Uh, a few explanations about uh, the platform we're using. On your right, you can see a chat. This is where you can say hi, a few of you uh, did it already, so don't be shy. Um, you can also report any technical issue that you would have. So if for any reason you have a, a video or sound problem, please uh, refer it there and our technical moderator uh, will help you out solving it. Uh, second thing, you have a question section. This is where you're going to be able to ask all the questions you'd like to ask to our expert today, um, because we will start by a presentation uh, followed by a hopefully very active Q&A session, so don't be shy. Uh, if you're too shy to ask questions, you can vote for the one you like the most. Uh, so uh, feel free to go ahead and, and check it uh, all along uh, this uh, webinar. Um, to explain you a bit uh, what we're going to talk about today, uh, as, as, as you understand, we're in a very competitive market uh, that prones consolidation. Uh, insurers are always looking for ways to differentiate themselves. With the rise of IoT, e-health, and telemedicine, uh, insurers have found new accelerators to go beyond their traditional offering. Uh, obviously boosted by the pandemic, telemedicine is here to stay. Uh, this webinar aims to inform you about the latest developments in the e-health and telemedicine and share how e-health is uh, sparking innovation in life and health insurance. Uh, obviously, we hope to inspire you by sharing several cases, uh, including the one of uh, AXA Poland uh, case study and how smart devices uh, can help for protection and prevention of health and how it proves to be an uh, ideal ally, both for the people in need of insurance 
assistance as well as uh, for their caregivers. Um, we'll also see how uh, Axapon leverage healthcare uh, services and wearables to supplement its life uh, insurance uh, offering. Uh, to start this uh, webinar, we're going to welcome the two first speakers, Emily Perroche d'Arnaud and uh, Wim van der Wilderoud, uh, both uh, business development managers for uh, financial services uh, insurance. If you want to join me, yeah, I see that you're uh, already activating on the chat. It's very nice to see you so active. I hope you'll be as active on the questions. Good morning, Emily. Good morning, Vim. Good morning, Julia. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, everyone, to, um, to be present today for our annual uh, insurance breakfast that we usually do um, uh, in person, but not virtually, but this time we decided to do in partnership with Paper Jam. But before we go to the order of the day of this webinar, I would like to ask Wim to do a quick recap on how Comarch has been doing this, uh, this past uh, month. I'll yeah. let you guys on stage and uh, join you afterwards. Thank you, Julien. Thank you, Amy. Uh, so uh, we're, we're happy to announce that Comarch is actually doing quite well in uh, 2020. Uh, so far, we, we do not see a major impact from the COVID crisis on our personal activities. Uh, so Comark made, for instance, a switch to, to homeworking, uh, servicing our global customers remotely uh, over the course of uh, one weekend. And while remote operations are running smoothly, uh, and meetings with our customers can be performed online. Uh, we do start missing, of course, our customers' friendly faces uh, from time to time. Uh, and as an IT company, uh, I would write actually quite fortunate, uh, we have to say, that uh, we see a stable appetite from our customers uh, to keep investing in digitalization. Uh, and even from other customers, other prospects, we even see an increased demand, uh, which might be driven by COVID. Um, so we're quite, quite fortunate there. Yeah, indeed. In conclusion, we are enlarging our footprint into the Benelux uh, market. Uh, I'm glad to announce that we reached the last milestone of our project with our dear customer, AXA Luxembourg, which is a project that covers the uh, setup of a front-to-back tool for distribution, claims management, and policy administration of their individual and um, group health insurance contracts. But COVID hasn't also stopped us to create a new partnership with uh, one of the leaders of the Belgium insurance market um, for the new front to back for distribution and administration of individual life insurance contracts. Uh, but saying this, I would like to highlight a few trends that we've been witnessing for uh, this past couple of months, a uh, few trends that uh, have been emerging since the beginning of the, of the COVID crisis. Um, and, um, and those trends, we managed to have it from, uh, from our feedbacks with our clients. Um, so first of all, the high pressure on the saving costs that IT is facing today. So insurance companies looking for economic alternative to use their tools. And one of those uh, alternatives could be the use of uh, those solutions into the cloud. So the cloud can be indeed cheaper as there is no servers, that as there is no maintenance fees as well. Um, and also how, because all the um, cost around the IT structure can be completely disconstructed and rebuilt in a different way. Um, so, so yeah, saying that, I'm really glad to say that um, uh, our insurance cloud will be ready from the beginning of next year. So let's see how it will be re welcomed to the uh, in, uh, Benelux uh, market. There is another trend as well that we've been witnessing that I would like to share with you today is that since the beginning of the crisis, since the beginning of this COVID pandemic, um, insurance companies are facing a huge backlog in terms of claims processes for the health insurance contracts. And in insurance companies have put a really high uh, priority on the, custom on the automatization of those processes. And especially in when they are touching health insurance business. Why? Because they cannot, they cannot afford to lose really important clients, um, especially when they are uh, dealing with some group insurance contract. And finally, another trend I would like to share with you is that since uh, the beginning of, of the year, the, the insurance market has been much more competitive uh, we've seen that new actors have been emerging, of course, because crisis is an enhancer of innovation. And you, like me, as 
users of many services from the GAFA, for example, we have a really high standard of expectation in terms of user experience. And today, insurance companies are a bit late on this specific link of the uh, um, insurance value chain. So we think that in the future, or 2021 would be maybe the year of the partnerships between traditional insurance companies and insurtech, startup, fintechs, but also innovation providers to try to address this specific link, uh, which is the user experience and try to reach those standards that we are all used to have now. Well, don't you, don't you think, uh, don't you think, sorry, Wim? Yeah, indeed, uh, insurers are operating in, in a very competitive market. Uh, it's also prone to consolidation. And we are observing an increased drive for insurers to differentiate themselves from uh, their competitors. Uh, and in the search for innovation uh, and differentiation, we often look at technology. So with the rise of IoT, e-health, telemedicine, uh, insurers may have already find, uh, found new accelerators to go beyond their traditional offering. Um, and while Comark is actually uh, well known in the Benelux as an IT provider for the financial services sector, providing front and back end solutions, uh, Comark is also active in other domains. And one of these uh, most uh, important domains is e-health and uh, telemedicine, for which we see a huge growth potential. Um, so today I'm, I'm very happy to introduce you to my dear colleagues, uh, Quintin and Kajimir, who will share you uh, their experience with e-health and illustrate how this uh, domain will go hand in hand uh, with insurance. So we really hope to inspire you today uh, on how the new approach in healthcare will also spark innovations in life and health insurance. Thank you very much, Emily and Wim, for this, uh, for this introduction. I think it's time to uh, move on to the, the, the second part of this, uh, of this webinar. We will uh, see you again at the end of the we'll be now in the Q&A session. See you later. Thank you. Uh, yes, it's time, in fact, to welcome our second speaker of today, or our, the second part for the third speaker. Uh, Quinton de Red is the sales director, telecom and e-health at Comarc. Uh, Quinton, if you want to join us on stage. Good morning. Yes, good morning. I hope this works. It works perfectly. And uh, so I will uh, leave you alone on stage for this uh, for this presentation. I remind to everyone that uh, you can ask questions if you want to react to whatever uh, is being said. All right, thank you very much for the introduction, uh, Julien, and thank you as well, uh, Women Emily, for the introduction. Good morning to everybody, and welcome on this session. Uh, thank you for being here. I'm happy that I have the, the ability and the possibility to speak here. Let me start by sharing my screen with you, which hopefully is working according to plan. If not, then shout out now. Um, normally, you should see my first slide now. All right, so a couple of interesting points uh, have been mentioned already by uh, women, Emily, uh, and I would like to tag on to them. When I was preparing for uh, today's presentation, I was looking through the people that were subscribing for, uh, for this session. And I noticed that the profiles of most people are very different um, from very different uh, branches of, uh, of the insurance and very different uh, positions. From this point of view, I was thinking, what can I present that it is accurate enough for all of them? Conclusion, unfortunately, is there is nothing that will be accurate enough for all of you. So let me at least give, do you the favor of clearly painting the scope of what I want to present to you today. Um, my goal is to present to you a much broader perspective on healthcare. And from this broader perspective, also show you the possibilities of how insurance players can take a role in that, how insurance business can go from a supporting role to an actual key role uh, in this business. So this is my main goal today. Um, and I'm aware that for some, this might be too high level, for other, uh, others, this might be already uh, too detailed, but I will try to, to strike a balance in between. So as I mentioned, the, uh, the broader perspective on healthcare if my slides would be moving, that would be fantastic. <laughs> and there we go. A broader perspective on healthcare. Why do I want to start with this? Because if you want to take a look at 
what an insurance company can do today and where uh, uh, from technological point of view what the possibilities are and how business possibilities could flow out of that i do believe it's important to understand a bit the background of that so i will start by uh, giving you a uh, a bit of uh, insight into that background exactly. So let's take a look at a broader trend that is going on in society. Digitalization is nothing new to you, and I'm not putting any rocket science on that slide, I'm perfectly aware. Digitalization has been ongoing uh, since, I would even argue since 60s, 70s uh, already. Because this started actually with a lot of automation that was happening. Automation that is still continuing up till today. Processes are being automated in all sectors. And this has, let's say, since uh, Industry 4.0, has taken a next step into pure digitalization. What do, we, what do I mean with that? We are taking everything mobile. We're taking every experience that we do in our daily lives, we're taking that to mobile world uh, or to the digital world, at least. Think about how the banking industry has changed and the insurance industry from that point of view as well. Nowadays, all of the insurance companies have uh, digital portals, have applications. The banks close down uh, a lot of their offices. And this is a trend that is not only in banking and insurance, but is a much broader society trend. The word digitalization has been a hype since 10 years already. And still it is ongoing and we're not at the end of that road. And healthcare is no exception to that rule. Healthcare has followed that trend of uh, digitalizations. Mm, I would say that I would argue that in some fields they have followed this trend in some fields they were pulling this trend even pulling this trend um, for example in uh, think about robotics robotics um, have been put let's say in um, uh, have been had a high focus on the industry of the healthcare think about uh, robotics for nanosurgery for example you needed robots or well, it would be very welcome, at least, and they're uh, they're actually active uh, in that industry. So, in in uh, way of technologization, this is really pulling the industry. Other ways, they're holding it back as well. Think about electronic health records. Actually, this should be a logical one nowadays. Uh, you, um, uh, my colleague Emily already mentioned how uh, we are, like, as a customer, are expecting great customer experience. Mm, let's say that when it comes to healthcare, typically we don't get that yet, especially not when it comes to the digital part of it. Uh, think about whom of you has access to their own electronic health records. Typically not a lot of people, or not at least to a coherent electronic health record. This kind of things they're lacking behind for sure. Uh, but there are other parts, for example, in, uh, in simple dental care. Dental care is actually a nice business and a, a good explanation. I, I happened to be at my dentist a couple of weeks ago. I needed a new tooth. You, I hope you will not see it. Um, and what I was amazed at is that my dentist took a device about this size, so let's say 15 centimeters long, and he started scanning my teeth and my jaw. Now, when I asked him how long he was using this device for 3D scanning my jaw, he told me he was using this since six years already. So from technology point, I found this pretty impressive. But what I found even more impressive was that at the very same time, I could see on his, on his computer the image being made of my jaw. And he was not scanning that in any particular order. No, this was fully automated software that could recognize perfectly where each uh, bit and piece uh, of my jaw could fit. And this I found pretty impressive. And it's a good example of how uh, dental care have uh, advanced uh, rapidly in technology. Dental care is actually also a good example of another uh, trend that we have seen in healthcare um, in the past couple of years. And it's a shift in mindset. We used to go to the dentist when we had uh, a toothache and then we went, uh, went there, we got it hopefully fixed. We went back home till the next time. And the very same thing at the, at the doctor's office. You go to a doctor's office when you feel sick, you are hopefully cured and you come back home. This is slightly changing. And uh, this is a, a shift in mindset that we see happening all over, I would say, because this goes uh, very much uh, from a society where we are aiming at a sick care, where we only care about our health when we are actually sick, to a, a real health care, to a true health care, where we are caring about our health. And you can only do that, and that's something that you can see happening in society, if you are having a, an increased interest in personal health status. Whom of you has a Fitbit? 
Uma View has uh, uh, maybe the latest Apple Watch, which, ha which has already um, some measurements included in that watch to measure vital signs of your body. This was not a, um, a lucky shot or not even an educated guess uh, on Apple's side. This is uh, not a coincidence. This is because they have noticed very well the trend of an increased interest in pers people's personal health status and the, uh, the their, their very closely connected trend of uh, self and remote monitoring and diagnosis. Because typically when you are aware uh, or being made aware that something is not 100% the way it should be, you will start looking for an answer. You will start looking on Dr. Google, or you will call your doctor. Why am I, what is the importance of all of these trends combined? It is one simple message. It is the fact that e-care is becoming increasingly important. And this is of course, uh, strongly uh, pushed at this very moment, uh, especially if we look at uh, remote monitoring and remote diagnosis. Um, this is strongly pushed by a crisis like, uh, like COVID-19. Um, which I would say is one of the few positive things about the uh, the crisis. But it is not a one-day fly that will be over after the crisis, neither. This is here to stay because it follows perfectly, as I try to, uh, to show to you, how this is following the general digitalization trend of society. Now, with eCare becoming more important, it's also, I want to come back to another concept. And it's exactly the shift from a sick care to a health care, because there is something important in that shift. In the traditional way of sick care, we were, as I told you before, uh, when we are as a patient, we feel sick, we go to a doctor, and that doctor, with support uh, of technology typically, he's putting a diagnosis and the patient goes back home. Maybe the patient will send you, the insurance company, the bill after that as well. But that's about where it stops as well. The main actors, the key players in this, uh, in this picture are the healthcare providers and only the direct healthcare providers, such as doctors. Now, this is something that is changing or that can change very drastically when we are looking at healthcare, where we still have, of course, our patient. But our patient will not necessarily only connect to our doctor anymore. The patient will use technology to contact whomever he needs or whomever is most convenient at that, uh, at that moment. Uh, it was already mentioned how we're expecting, um, just like we are expecting from uh, Google, from Amazon, from Netflix, uh, these beautiful experiences. You don't decide based on what, you're, um, what you actually need. You decide on what is easy to reach. And from this point of view, it could be anybody that you can reach. The caregiver in this picture will definitely not go away because you will need caregivers. They are a fixed part in that, uh, in that equation and that will not go away. I've put here two other examples, um, but they are not exclusive. A patient could perfectly contact you as an insurance company in order to get in touch with a doctor, for example, or they could even ask you to, uh, to act as a monitoring center for their health or for certain alarmings that they need. Uh, because this goes even broader than health, but I will come back to that topic. So what is happening in this case is the whole e-care uh, landscape is creating oxygen for new players. And it's important to highlight that because I'm talking about new players, not necessarily insurance companies. These examples could perfectly be any other B2C company. This could be a telecommunications uh, company for all I care because they perfectly have to reach out to the patient as well. They could set up their own monitoring center and start distributing monitoring devices. They have the capacity to do that. And it would be a missed chance for insurance companies not to do so, because it's very closely related at the end of the day uh, to, especially for the medical monitorings, to the expenditures that you will be paying, uh, or at least a part of you uh, will be paying for that. And this, from this point of view, the insurance companies definitely have a strong edge to play an important role and take a very different role from where in the sick air you, uh, uh, you are uh, just uh, without meaning that in any negative connotation, uh, a supporting role picking up the bill to being actually a touch point for your customer. And playing that touch point could actually give you a com very competitive edge as well. I believe also some companies have already started doing this. I would say that most of insurance companies have started the wave of basic digitalization. 
What do I mean with this? I'm talking about uh, portals that you have online. I'm talking about mobile applications that uh, most of patients are using. But to what end do they, at this moment, for most of them, serve? It is to ease the burden of administration, which is, of course, an excellent start. But it is nowadays a given. It is not something that will uh, put you separately from the rest uh, of the company, of the insurance companies anymore. Some companies have understood that perfectly well. And so some have taken this already uh, a step further and are enabling access to doctors. What do I mean with that? There, you are probably aware about uh, digital insurance companies uh, that are on the market, coming onto the market, and which are offering to customers, for example, to have uh, to have the possibility to always contact via chat or via another mean uh, an actual doctor. Um, these doctors are typically, or at this moment, at least. Uh, from what I know of or, or what I've seen, they're not yet uh, actually working for the insurance companies. This is via partner companies. But it is the insurance company, and this is important, that is the touch point. That is, the from customer, from patient point of view, the, uh, the go-to party. And this uh, increases their role and visibility tremendously. It doesn't need to stop there. Um, I've put here a question mark because there is a lot that is possible. And there is a lot that is possible, not only on the pure e-health, but you could easily extend that with IoT devices to other measuring devices in the houses. I'll come back to that point, but it's, it's important to understand that this train has just left the station, but it will go if we look at the, the rapid pace that the, uh, the, uh, the Industrial uh, Revolution 4.0 uh, is going through at this moment. This is going to go, go at an incredibly high pace, and it is quintessential to be there from the very beginning, not to be lost. Now, let's make it a bit more tangible for you. Uh, let's see how that could actually look like. Um, how could that potentially um, uh, be given a form? An important disclaimer to put there is what I'm about to show you now are two very basic and very simple examples. Um, we could think of, I could think easily of 10 others, and I'm pretty sure that if we get in touch with each other and we discuss about this, we could easily think of 10 other use cases for that as well. So it's just to give you an idea, not to keep it just um, all fluffy and high level. Let's talk about Pete and Sarah. Pete is a 50 years old uh, diabetes type two patient. And Sarah is an eight-year-old uh, lady who has difficulties to walk. She has a known weak heart condition, and she is still living in the house that she built with her very own hands, and she would love to live her le to keep living there. When it comes to Pete, let's look at how his well, let's not say his daily life, but his daily medical life is going. Um, he's taking his measurements, uh, as most diabetes uh, uh, patients do. He will get his insulin when it's needed, and two or four times a year, a bit depending on the situation, and with a bit of luck, he will visit his doctor or diabetes coach. In such, mm, in such interviews with his doctor, the chance to, rapid, uh, to follow up rapidly, to play close onto prevention, uh, will be very limited. Um, and this is uh, for people who are not familiar with the, the problematics of uh, diabetes uh, type 2. It is known that prevention is uh, one of the key factors there in order to, uh, to prevent uh, further diseases and from that point of view, cost uh, when you look at it from an insurance point of view. Sarah, as I said, she is still living in the house where she is, uh, uh, that she built herself. She's in doubt whether she will do, stay there or go to an elderly home. Her family also is quite concerned uh, as uh, given her difficulties to walk. She loves walking in the nature, but if she falls, then she will not be able to call for assistance. This is a very simple picture. And what I'm presenting to you is no rocket science, as I told you before. But it is important to understand that this could, uh, could look dramatically, uh, dramatically different in an e-care uh, model. If you take a look at an e-care model, Pete's measurements could be easily automatically registered. His values could be perfectly monitored by a remote monitoring center. He can have a diabetes coach uh, on a video call, enabling him to have a much closer follow-up uh, to see that if there is, uh, not in three months, but in one or two weeks' time, there is a certain trend in his values that is appearing that something is being done about this. And you will have a patient that you can actually, on one hand, prevent from having further diseases, and from this point of view, being a higher cost. But also, you will have a patient that actually can, uh, can feel care about. From Sarah, 
that's a very different solution that you could implement. But it's equally easy, I would say. You could give her a wristband, a simple wristband, which has GPS location, which has uh, mobile and everything uh, included into it. Um, she can call for help whenever she would need it. She can take a walk in the woods if she would uh, happen to have a fall. Um, help can be dispatched immediately um, because her GPS location will be known to the monitoring center. That monitoring center could be run by you or via you. That even does not matter that much. The point is that you are the one providing Sarah with the wristband. You're providing her with the uh, peace of mind as well as her family, because they will be able to follow her uh, status via an application as well. And it's being this touch point that is a, a key role or a key differentiator when you look at uh, today's landscape or how things are now. Now, I'm perfectly aware that uh, insurance has at least the name <laughs> of being um, money incentive driven, uh, or at least uh, to, to put it more simple, most people consider insurance companies as greedy. So let's talk about money. Show me the money, or rather, show me the savings, because that's what it boils down to here. What I'm showing you on this graphic is GDP savings, or percentages of, on the GDP. So health expenditures, as you can see, are um, depending on countries, somewhere ranging between 5 and 10% of the GDP. And if you research has shown that if you would implement full e-health and m-health you will reduce these costs impressively if you take a look at belgium that will be 0.5 percent of the gdp luxembourg even 0.6 uh, these numbers might not sound big but please bear in mind this is not a percentage of um, the health expenditures itself it's as a percentage of the gdp uh, that you are uh, that uh, this reference is taken to if you're wondering by the way why i'm showing you figures from 2014 that would be a very valid question this is data coming from a, a european commission report uh, which was published in 2018 and at least to my knowledge uh, is the latest one uh, on this stage which i actually regret strongly because i'm pretty sure that with the current status and stance of e-health and m-health these percentages could even be increased now let's talk about another example of savings. Maybe I will argue or I will hope that most of you who have already been busy with e-health in the insurance industry have taken a look at these, uh, these tables. And I apologize for the fact that they're being quite small. Um, what is important to understand or what is shown on these tables? So first of all, this first table is showing from patient point of view uh, the cost. Uh, this was research done in Sweden, as you can see. And they are comparing the digital model versus the in-office model. The second uh, table is showing you uh, the fact that uh, the total society costs. Once more, the digital versus the in-office model. What is interesting here is to see that in both cases, the digital model gives you a saving of over 40%. This is a direct saving that is being made. And I'm perfectly aware that this is Swedish research and from it's always extremely difficult to compare countries uh, one with another. So I will not tell you that you will have exactly the same savings here um, or in the region where you're working. But even if you would cut these savings in half uh, to make it more applicable to your situation, it is still a huge amount of money that you're saving on that. So from that point of view, I believe that on a direct cost saving, there is a lot to be gained. But there is much more than that. And I will not go in uh, too long because I see that my time is running quite, uh, quite fast as well. I won't uh, go in, in a lot of details, but let's have a quick look still on how, what could it bring more to an insurance company. On one hand, it is driving down your costs as just discussed, as just discussed. But what is probably equally important is the fact that you can prevent a lot of costs. And I want to quickly zoom in on that because you cannot only prevent costs related to health, but as I said earlier, if you are monitoring your patients and if you're uh, installing, for example, concepts like a safe house in which you will make sure that you implement uh, certain meters, certain measuring devices within houses, you can even uh, uh, come to new types of, uh, uh, of insurance policies thanks to that alone, because you will be able to measure uh, via Internet of Things uh, certain things within a house that will prevent uh, damage uh, on property. You also have a better customer knowledge. Now, 
I'm perfectly aware that is a disputed point because that's where we get on the edge of privacy. Now, I don't believe that the debate has fully closed yet, and especially uh, taking into account research, which has clearly shown that customers are actually willing to give up a part of their privacy if they get tangible benefits. I believe it is uh, this debate is not at the end yet. But also think about the fact that you will have customers who feel constantly cared by their insurance company. That is an experience, and uh, pardon, uh, pardon me for saying so, but most companies, insurance companies at this moment are not being able to offer it. They're aiming at it, yes, but most of them are not actually achieving it. Last but not least, new po uh, policy possibilities. And I want to give two very brief examples on that. Um, you could perfectly think of a, a new way of a policy where you are um, where you are lowering the premium of the policy by X amount of X percent in case that the patient is um, or client in your uh, terminology that your client is um, sending measurements at least once per week, for example. I'm just uh, uh, thinking of some uh, some example. Even if you don't, due to the privacy uh, intrusion, if you don't have insight into those measurements, it is still very valuable because a customer which will have seen that there is something wrong with a certain value will start looking um, a preventive path uh, of, uh, uh, for his health. But you could also think of very different uh, examples. Think about a life insurance, which is actually not giving you any sum of money at the end of, uh, of the ride but which is giving you peace of mind, which is giving you exactly this bracelet. Um, and from this point of view, is hope is rather a life assurance than an insurance. I will not detail this too much because my colleague Kazimir uh, will go into this uh, 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 very shortly as well. I will not go because my time is really running out, so I will not uh, detail the patient benefits, but I think it's easy to understand uh, quite quickly that also from patient point of view, um, there's a lot of things to gain um, in the whole e-health story. Um, and having a good counterpart, such, an, uh, such as an insurance company taking care of that, um, would be of tremendous value. What was my goal of showing you today? We are in a society which has a trend, a very clear trend of digitalization that is not going anywhere, as is eCare, which is also only taking off and going further. And this train has started with quite a few uh, insurance companies already looking into this, some actually executing uh, first steps in those new kind of policies, new, um, new business models and new way of taking position in the market. And this is something I believe you will need to be fast with because I will repeat that once more before I pass the word to my colleague. You are not the only players that are the potential players in this game. You have a true edge because you have the insight, you have the additional benefit. So the, the edge is real, is big, but other players are lurking on this uh, space as well and will be very happy to to take part of this uh, this pie so i believe it's uh, time is really there for insurance companies to to look into this and to to move to the next level to give you even more inspiration on that on um, how that looks could you look in use cases and how you could implement that on a practical level um, i will pass the word to my colleague uh, kashmir cheschak uh, to to discuss this as well thank you very much Thank you very much, Quinton. And in fact, it raised questions because there are already two questions that have been asked. So feel free to ask questions and you will be uh, staying with us uh, for a Q&A session uh, right after. And uh, it actually raised me a question of, uh, uh, you're talking about the players that might develop that kind of things and, and probably players that come out of the health insurance sector. Uh, I mean, we see people that uh, were doing electric cars that are able now to do uh, space stuff, for example. <laughs> If, if tomorrow, and pretty, pretty, pretty well done also. I mean and that. pretty well done. And if tomorrow, uh, with the experience they have, they decide uh, to launch themselves in this kind of business, they might they might be successful. So this is the, this is where it's interesting. Anyway, well, I'll ask you that question directly afterwards. Yeah. Uh, it was just a teasing for the other one. See you after, Quinton. Thank you very yeah, much. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, I, I I repeat it, but go ahead and ask your questions. Don't. Uh, don't be shy. Uh, I see that Mary, you made a comment, but you can even turn it into in, into a question. So don't uh, don't hesitate. For uh, this uh, last part of the presentation, before going to a Q&A, I'm going to welcome now uh, Kazimierz Czechak, the consultant director uh, for Comarch. 
Kashimir, uh, if you want to join me on stage, you're more than welcome. And we'll talk. We'll discuss the business case of uh, AXA in Poland uh, together with Kazimierz. Good morning. Good morning. Not only AXA in Poland. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you for very much for possibility of being with you. So this is something still very new for me, uh, the virtual reality. But but great that we can meet together. Uh, I'm sure so you're going to you, I'll, I'll let you on stage. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so thank you very much, uh, Quinten, for the bigger picture that, that you presented uh, for the audience. Uh, so uh, I will show you now uh, the building blocks this, that we as a Comar have in our portfolio. Why building blocks? So we already experience uh, so in e-health sector and experience uh, with cooperation with insurance company. But unfortunately, there is no ready recipe for uh, every player of in insurance market. Uh, and why? I will just elaborate about it. So first of all, I would like to uh, show you uh, why. So I got the same case as Quinten, but it, it, it works now. Perfect. Uh, so why, uh, as a company, we are able to, to, to give you the, our feedback, uh, show you our uh, building blocks in healthcare? So first of all, so we are a company grounded uh, in Poland more than 27 years ago. And we, in healthcare division, got three parts that are very specific for the healthcare. So first of all, we've got uh, the ability to create software, to integrate software with interoperability uh, with other solution. Uh, then we uh, also, we are producing our own medical devices uh, at our IoT plant. And we've got our own medical facility, our own medical center with ma more than 100 physicians. And uh, it gives us the possibility to test in vivo the solution and to integrate uh, with, the, with the life sector, with everyone. Uh, yeah, so we can also speak about two different uh, speeds of implementing the e-health. So uh, previously, before the pandemics, it was developing, so we had a lot of businesses in Europe, also in the States. We've got inquiries from different markets, but now during the pandemics, uh, it moved very, very quickly. As already mentioned here, uh, as a company, we moved almost everything to the clouds and also the healthcare part, so related to our clouds. So first of all, uh, we are providing the hospital information system, EHR system, so we can gather the data, we can transform all the data uh, using uh, medical uh, AI cloud, and we also are using telemedicine. And I will be focusing today uh, mostly about the telemedicine and telecare solution, because from our uh, businesses that we are running with, with, with partner uh, on insurance part of the business, so this is something that, is, that can uh, so talking about the telemedicine and telecare, so these are three, uh, mostly the most important part. First of all, you've got the platform. Uh, so this is something that, that we are using. Uh, sorry for this. I, I, think that I just only have a pointer, but okay. So it will be perfect red um, painting here. So we've got the Iker platform. So the telemedicine platform and also uh, the people that are watching the signals. Uh, then, of course, uh, as well, we've got uh, also the, the people that are watching uh, signals, watching information, and also uh, we've got medical devices. So we've got me different medical devices. We've got medical devices uh, that, that are connected to the platform. Uh, we've got different solutions for uh, different types of diseases. And here I would start with the first uh, part of the of our solution. So this is the, the wristband, uh, the simple tool that we can equip our Peter, as as Quinten told us. Uh, so we uh, we are able to to uh, call for help to get all information. So the the, the people equipped with our uh, bracelet with wristband uh, can uh, be in touch not only uh, with the monitoring center but also. Uh, with uh, family using the application for, for them. So if there is a need to call for help, uh, we can use the solution. Of course, we already extended the solution. So the, 
life wristband with telecare services for same safe home. Uh, the safe home solution is uh, the home equipped with different IoT related uh, sensors, like for example, motion sensor uh, or flammable gas detectors. So we can equip the senior homes to, to rise the comfort of them and to help them to stay uh, at home. Then uh, another part of the solution related uh, to the insurance and, and to, to the product that we already, uh, yeah, we, we, we've got the pilot project running and also the, the project uh, is the solution of connecting um, different medical devices to the cloud using uh, the communication hub. So like uh, this is the, 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 the tablet or the mobile application, also uh, medical uh, software with certification. And we are able to send the medical data to the platform. We can also equip uh, the diagnostic point. So for example, we can uh, put the diagnostic point you can see on the right side in the booth. Uh, and uh, there is installed in the offices. Uh, uh, and also uh, in insurance company, and why I will uh, talk to you a little bit later about it. And on the right side, you've got the mobile version of the diagnostic point. So the mobile version of the diagnostic point is something uh, that, for example, you can equip the medical professionals uh, or paramedics uh, with the medical kit. And then there is the part that you can, first of all, save the money. Uh, because of them for also for insurance company and also you can keep the people at home so you can lower the cost of uh, medical uh, care and this is something that i would like told you about uh, the use cases that we already uh, implemented so for example the case uh, of bracelets uh, one region in poland uh, decided so you, you see the here to equip 10,000 senior citizens uh, to equip uh, them with life bracelets and also one of the city uh, in the northern Poland uh, decided to equip home uh, with uh, the um, safe home equipment related to IoT as well. Uh, then of course our first cooperation uh, with insurance companies so the, it was something that we are really proud of so the AXA Poland company uh, got so they calculated the risk they calculated what they can gain for for them and for the customers so they decided to implement uh, the life wristband uh, as a additional uh, insurance uh, and and they they uh, selling this uh, for the elderly people uh, for also for the family members uh, this so this is the case of uh, like a, so with monthly premium and this is uh, the, the, the solution, the whole solution uh, implemented with cooperation uh, with AXA. Uh, we should take care of uh, senior people. So uh, we, we've gotten the numbers, uh, how the society is getting older and the, the cost is skyrocketing. That's why uh, the use cases of the telemedicine solution for seniors are really uh, something that can help uh, the, the, the companies to reduce the cost and also uh, for the people uh, to stay at home and to, to be more preventive uh, uh, according to, um, to the medical condition as well. Uh, we are focusing, and here I'm also showing you these building blocks on specific medical cases, like for example, uh, pulmonology. So the chronic diseases, there are mostly very uh, that they cost a lot of money for the insurance company and also for the medical providers. So uh, equipping the, the, the people with the uh, solution that can save the time and the money. So this is crucial. Uh, cardiology cases as well. Uh, the second or the third already uh, case addressed by the telemedicine. So we can also talking about blood sugar and different cases. So we implemented the whole knowledge into the systems. And then information, uh, we, we were talking about the cost, we are talking about uh, the insurance company, but please uh, have a look uh, what policy holders can achieve implementing also uh, the telemedicine, the e-health solution, so contributing the whole scope of uh, very modern 
devices and a very modern path of uh, taking care uh, into the products. And here, just at the end, uh, the question, where are we heading? So this is something very important because so we know that uh, here now, uh, so this is the reality that we should focus on the aims, on the goals for uh, our customers uh, and also uh, what you as an insurance company uh, can achieve and what are the opportunities from your perspective. Um, so dedicated uh, solutions or dedicated uh, proposal that we already, uh, yeah, that we faced with the market, we already did, did the, the research and, and we know that there is something that can be uh, very useful for you. So we've got, uh, first of all, the wristband. So equipping uh, the, the, your customer with wristband, then switching the healthcare from the most expect most uh, ex, uh, um, cost generating uh, places like hospital to home and also uh, having the, the uh, case of COVID now and also equipping uh, places with uh, diagnostic point giving the possibility uh, to put information and in, in the personal health diary uh, to keep the all information safe in cloud and, and to allow to share the information uh, with the doctor. So just at the end, uh, something that the healthy people and the healthy view will be showing us. And I wish all of us uh, that we stay healthy. Uh, few words about me, more than 20 years in business, healthcare business economist. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for the possibility to share uh, the information. Thank you very much, uh, Kazimir, for all those explanation and those, uh, those use cases. It's very interesting to see uh, how applicable all those things are and how applicated they are, <laughs> because sometimes it seems far away for us and, and in the end it's already working. So it's, uh, it's quite impressive. I think it's time to move on for the Q&A. So I'm going to invite uh, uh, all the other speakers to join us uh, back here uh, on the stage. Uh, so, uh, so Quinten, if you want to come back. Emily and, uh, and 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 we as well. We have quite a few questions that have been uh, that have been asked. So um, so we're gonna we're gonna focus on it. Um, I, I'll start with the, the question that received the most vote. Um, it's a, it's a question from uh, Marc Antoine Van Oud, um, and uh, he, he talks to us about the the, the, the law that are arriving. Uh, what do you make out of the law proposition in Belgium that prohibits using uh, IoT health data? Uh, to give uh, premium incentives, because obviously when you arrive with new technology, the regulation and the regulator uh, act, and, and how do you think it's going to evolve? What, what do you do with it? Uh, I don't know who of you would like to take this, uh, this, this first question. I'll be happy to I'll be happy to take it, uh, Julien. Thank you. Um, well, the, the question is very uh, is very accurate, of course, and I think you you will have noticed uh, that I made me, uh, a slight reference to this already uh, while I was uh, while I was presenting. So it is indeed this kind of loss. Um, feelings are very mixed because on one hand, I think um, the the goals or what uh, the the lawmaker is trying to achieve is. Um, it somehow makes a sense. At the same time, um, the question is if it is not count, uh, counterproductive. Um, what I there's a couple of uh, very mm, uh, parallel thoughts in my head when I think about this question. On one hand, um, let's take a look at how insurance companies have always actually tried to uh, uh, try to find new ways of doing things. And we're often quite blocked. Uh, think about the fact that you are uh, that you're trying to to profile your people in order to uh, to determine the risks better. Um, this was something that uh, had a lot of protest in the beginning. Right now, not that much anymore. If we take a look at um, how uh, the the insurance companies uh, that are uh, giving you a car insurance, uh, depending on how many kilometers you drive, you could see that as a step in that direction as well. Be it much less intrusive. I, I would fully are, uh, agree to that. Uh, much less intrusive, yes, because when we are talking about health data, we are talking about much more sensitive data. 
question from my point of view is always, are people actually willing to do that? Um, and what will they get in return? Let's take another parallel thought on that. If you take a look at teleconference, not teleconferencing, but um, teleconsultations, this was something that was held back and not approved as a valid way of consultations in healthcare um, up till the beginning of COVID. And all of a sudden you see a pandemic coming and things get into a rapid change. And I believe that could be the same here. Uh, I think the, the first reaction of the lawmakers is a, um, a scared reaction. Uh, which is not necessarily helping things forward. Um, at the same time, I'm also wondering, is that a true blocker for you at this moment? As I mentioned it before, uh, I do understand the, the impact that it has on making uh, very specific uh, or really tailoring your premiums uh, to the actual behavior, because that's what we're talking about at the end of the day. Question is if you really need that if you cannot make a, a first step already and let's be honest i don't see many insurance companies that are already on that step where you are just giving that service making sure that data is being checked by your own customer because as i mentioned before a customer that is already checking his own uh, health status will probably be a lower risk for you already um, rather than a customer that is not checking his own self health status at all so even if you don't have access to the content of the data just the fact that there is a measurement being taken this i believe could already create opportunities but i will fully agree with you that it will have an impact uh, for the rest and that this is um, something to be clarified i don't believe as i said earlier that this debate is fully closed i think that de that debate has just started yeah it just um, started obviously exactly and this bill will will not necessarily work in favor of progress uh, on this field uh, there I, I couldn't argue against that but i do believe that is uh, subject to change hopefully in a short while well, pr pragmatically, uh, to to react on what you just said, uh, you, you were mentioning before the, the profits that can be made, uh, generally speaking, obviously, for both uh, uh, states, I mean, governments, uh, and users, and, and, uh, and health insurance companies. So I guess that uh, once the profit will be shared and how it will be shared might also uh, move the lines here because exactly. it, it, in the end if uh, if you can have belgium gaining 0 0.5 percent of their gdp uh <laughs> correct in, they, they, in, they should be interested not only the insurance companies but also the public sick funds uh, should be very interested for, uh, from that point of view uh I, I fully agree on that so they they do have an incentive um but i believe that the, the privacy debate at this moment uh, is on such a high level on the agenda and in my personal opinion quite often a bit um a bit cl clouded debate uh, with some va voices uh, shouting very hard, not necessarily making strong arguments, uh, not necessarily research-based. Um, and I think at uh, over some time that uh, evidence-based things will, will prevail uh, much more on that. Uh, but well, only time will tell, of course. <laughs> Obviously. And, and generally speaking, do you think that uh, other movements uh, with sharing data, so, such as PSD2, for example, in the in, in the, the, the finance industry, generally speaking, uh, will help uh, in in this uh, sharing uh, health data, for example. Well, I, I would say that um, the the direction of this debate will will be for sure um, be guided by the general feeling there is and the general trend uh, uh, that there is uh, around such issues. So yes, I do believe that might be helpful, be it not in a direct way, uh, more in a more in a trend setting way, let's say. Okay. Um, there was a second question from Alexander Mann, but, it, but it's it's still around that uh, law in Belgium. So <laughs> I tend to I tend to. Yeah, to take another one. Uh, sorry, Alexon. <laughs> um, we have a question uh, from Mary Carey uh, uh, about how how will you manage uh, the, the, the 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 where is going to be stored in the survey security. The exact question is the, the technology is fantastic here, but uh, but uh, people and especially the end user uh, might fear for for security. So how do you think about addressing this topic? Um, do you imagine in the future that there can be ransomware or things like this? Because it's it's really important personal data and medical data. Um, how do you see it and, and, and how do actors uh, react on it right now? 
Yeah, I can take this question from my perspective. So this is something that, uh, so my history was that I was also working for the biggest university hospital in Poland and the data privacy and the safety of the IT uh, infrastructure and solutions. So this is something very crucial. And I'm really happy that uh, our company uh, running the clouds, running the, our own infrastructure. So for us, the safety of the data uh, is uh, one of the top priorities uh, now. Uh, so this is, uh, as a company, we are cooperating uh, with, uh, of course, insurance sector, with banking sector, also with military sector. So uh, as a healthcare part, we can take uh, the best uh, practices, we can take the whole uh, know-how inside our company and implement it into the, in the our medical uh, software medical systems. Uh, if there is uh, the data, there is all, always the risk of uh, some problems with the data. So that's why uh, we are really uh, working proactively uh, to fulfill the all requirements and also to test our uh, whole infrastructure or ecosystem uh, according to the safety. So there is uh, no... Uh, possibility that, that everything uh, will be 100% uh, sure. But we are doing all the best that we can to assure that, that the data, medical data, the most crucial data for everyone, for everyone will be uh, safe. So this is my answer for this question. Thank, thank you very much. To, to, to go further, um, I mean, we, we all give, uh, I mean, not medical data, but a lot of data to GAFAs on a daily basis, and we almost never question it. Uh, how can a sector like insurance uh, uh, transform the relationship they have with the customer to make sure that people will share their data? Because uh, with GAFAs, you have nothing to win when you share your data. I mean, you, you don't earn anything at the end of the month. Uh, you don't have premiums because, uh, because Apple knew exactly uh, when you were going, where you were going. I mean, when you go to your car right now, your, your cell phone asks you if you're going back home, if you're going to the, to the office. So he knows already the pattern of your day, it knows already where you're going and, and invites you to do things. Uh, I mean, tomorrow, obviously, uh, probably Amazon will uh, ar arrive and tell you that your fridge is empty and so you should buy something. So basically, we're already sharing a lot uh, with, with GAFAs. How, how can trustable uh, partners like life insurance or yeah, insurance company, health insurance company, gain that trust uh, with their customer, because in the end, this is w what they have to do is, is is make the journey so that people will be willing to share it with them. How how can they start it? What's the first uh, what's the first milestone of it? Maybe I can share my uh, perspective on that one. Um, I think it's about it's it's uh, it's about uh, for, from the customer perspective, it's always about what's in it for me, uh, and um, I don't think we will get to the, uh, let's say, using data of the customer just like that and, and having access to them just like that. It's about building trust. It's about going step by step. And what the, the point that Quinton touched, uh, I, I, it was a good example to, to leverage, let's say, uh, health uh, records um, to reduce the premium. I think it might, might happen in, uh, already today in some countries, in others maybe more, uh, let's say, prudent. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think you start uh, by uh, offering services and building trust with the customer. And um, if today the, the technology is leveraged, um, let's say as a measure for prevention, uh, and the customer will see that the insurer is not using their data, is not actually doing anything bad with it. Uh, it's like Google's initial credo, uh, don't be evil. Um, then I think the customer will uh, step by step um, gain more trust in institutions and also see that there's a lot of benefits uh, for them. Okay, yeah. so what's in it for me? <laughs> and and if, I, if, if I might add to that, um, so indeed I fully agree with what one said, and what's in it for me is, uh, is one thing. And I think that this building trust, uh, transparency is an, is an issue of extreme importance there. And I think that is something that, especially in the insurance industry is lacking at this moment. Most people don't, trust their insurance company. I will speak for myself. I don't trust mine. I've had too many issues with it. Uh, so I believe that transparency in uh, in uh, in the policies uh, is 
is it is something that is already high on the agenda for insurance companies because I think they are perfectly aware. Uh, all of you are perfectly aware that this is a main driver between for trust and from that point of view uh, for uh, retaining customers. Uh, and I think there's still a, a way to go there. So um, I fully agree with Wim point, Wim's point, and I think one way to build that is to increase transparency level. And you see that, for example, um, if you take a look at uh, some of the new digital uh, players, digital insurance players on the market, they are really aiming at that. Um, and they are advertising their transparency uh, everywhere they can uh, as their main breaking point, their main advantage point. And I believe it is a very smart way forward. Thank you very much, uh, Quinton. Um, time is passing by quickly. Uh, so, uh, so, so, so to actually be transparent with our, uh, with our participants, we, we we, we said to them that it will last about an hour. So it's going to be the last question. Uh, uh, the last question is, um, we see obviously a lot of opportunities uh, with those new with the new feeders. Uh, but to go back to what I was saying after you, uh, you, you speak, Quentin, uh, how much of an opportunity is it and how much of a threat is it? Because you have new players that can, that can absolutely transform that industry that are already very uh, good at uh, the customer journey, very good at managing data, uh, very good at bringing back value quickly. So um, how quick uh, should the insurance sector embrace all those changes to make sure that it's not someone from another sector who will, who will take the lead? Well, it, it, it's a very good question, but an extremely difficult one to answer as well. Sorry. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> um, from, from one point of view, uh, the, the, the sooner the better. Uh, in an ideal world, if you really want to have an edge, you want to come out on the market uh, as a first one with this. And this will, for most insurance companies, most probably not happen because you have a lot of legacy to, uh, to take with you, uh, both um, business model and um, IT uh, side. So there's a lot of legacy that uh, that is being carried uh, carried with you, which makes it much, much harder and much more difficult uh, to actually make the, the same breakthrough as some uh, some small, new smaller new players could do. Um, however, if you want to beat them, uh, and not, I'm not only talking about new players, uh, the example I mentioned earlier is not an example that was coming out of the blue uh, telecom industry. They are perfect. They're continuously look, looking. Look, their revenues are in uh, steep decline. Even uh, with COVID, uh, bring them some uh, some additional revenue, but a lot of uh, additional burden as well. Their revenues are in decline, and they're looking for many years already. How can we get new revenue, new business on the market? The moment that they will see an easy entry for that, they will have the financial capacity to move rapidly into those spaces. So I do believe that time is of the essence, and I'm not talking obviously uh, that we will see next year, next uh, next week, or even in a couple of months that we will see the big new players around the block. Implementations like this do take time. They do they take serious consideration on how to move forward, but. It is important that uh, the, the journey starts now. Uh, I believe that if you haven't started thinking about this within this and half a, half a year, you will be too late and you will be missing the train. And telcos already launched their own financial services, their own banks. They're very active on those, on those new sectors. And in fact, they, they, they manage the technology. I mean, we were talking about IoT before. Uh, when you have the technology and the network, um, yes, it's it, it's a quite of a competitive advantage. Uh, does any one of you uh, want to add something to this uh, last question, Emily, Vim, uh, Casimir? No, no, I just uh, I just wanted to say that I completely agree with uh, Quinton. And as I said during my uh, introduction, I think that uh, it shouldn't be seen as a threat for the insurance companies, but more as an opportunities uh, to develop their uh, insurance offers, uh, the product offering, and uh, through the building of partnerships and uh, with, these, uh, with these new actors. Because they have the knowledge on the specific link of this value chain, and they can share it with uh, with insurance uh, companies that might might have like knowledge on overlinks of the value chain. So yeah, this is what I wanted to add. Well, I think it's going to be the, the the last word, the conclusion of today. Yeah. <laughs> For the girl. <laughs> Abs absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Well, thank you all very very much uh, to share these uh, these expertise and these those insight with us. I think it was very very clear and very interesting. So thank you very very much, uh, Casimir Emily. Thank Jim you. and Quentin. Thank You're you very welcome. Much. Very much. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. And um, I will uh, I will have the, the, the last word. Um, not to uh, 
not to finish uh, the, the the seminar, but to give you the, the appointments for what's going on next. Um, we, we we have other events coming up that I, I'd like to invite you to uh, tonight, this evening. Uh, we will still talk about digitalization, but uh, about the, 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 the industry. So we have a 10 by 6, our, our star format, uh, still in digital. Uh, smart factories to realize that the industry is quite far uh, in the digitalization. We'll talk about the industry 4.0 next week on December 1st. I think that someone went to be too fast. Uh, on December 1st, uh, next week, we'll talk about comment se connecter à de nouveaux prospects en ces temps nouveaux, together with the Alfred Glasson uh, from Grow to Excellence. You can enroll directly here. It's going to be a French event. And um, next uh, Wednesday, actually, on the 2nd of December, we'll have the pleasure to welcome Jean-Pierre Zigrand. Jean-Pierre Zigrand is a Luxembourgish teacher at the London School of Economics, world specialist about the systemic risk uh, in the real estate market, and we'll focus uh, the conference on the Luxembourgish uh, 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 real estate market and its, its, its eventual bubble. Thank you very, very much for following us and be so active on the chat and the questions. Have a great end of day. Bye-bye.